it's time for a QA. and a It feels like forever since we've done the last Q&A. So a couple of days ago on my Instagram, I asked you guys what sort of things you wanted to know, whether you had any questions, and they were specifically related to travel, which I always find really interesting. And you had so many awesome questions down there. It was actually really hard to go through and pick like only a couple to really address. Otherwise we'd be sitting here for hours and hours and hours. But now Ken and I are here and we thought we would do that. We actually had 453 questions. <laughs> well, some were just like stupid, but the, there was a lot. You're not allowed to look at this, by the way. What do you mean? Because I'm asking you the questions. It's my Instagram. I've seen the comments. Yeah, but oh, but I don't know which ones you've narrowed I, it down. Yeah, to. I don't want you to prep for it. I don't want you to look over my shoulder and go, oh, okay. But I, I want to prep next. for it. My answers will be so much better if I know what's coming. No, I want you to be natural. So if you're new to our channel, a travel Q&A is relevant because for the last two years, Ken and I have been doing a lot of travel. Uh, we love exploring the world and we've kind of quit our jobs to do that pretty much full time. And so this Q&A is kind of to demonstrate how we do that, how we got into that and all the little tips and tricks that we can give related to your trips. This one got the most amount of upvotes. It says, how do you travel with such a hunky boyfriend and stay focused <laughs> on your work? You wrote this. Babe. Serious question this time. Okay, so what was what has been the most beautiful place you've visited so far? The most beautiful place I think has to be the Maldives. Would you agree? Like nature wise? It was one of those places, like a lot of the time if you go somewhere, there's like a good angle that way and it yeah. looks beautiful. But then if you look behind you, it's like buildings or like, I don't know, like rubbish in a different direction. When we went to the Maldives, it was honestly breathtaking because wherever you look was like a pristine postcard. I've never seen anything like it. I thought it was ridiculous. So we have to go back. Yeah, I think if you look at somewhere like Egypt where you can see the pyramids, but if you you notice with the shots of the pyramids, nobody ever takes a wide shot because you've got a massive city. You're literally, it's just on the edge of a city. So it's not great if you shoot it from this angle. But in the Maldives, every angle is a good angle. It's just incredible. It genuinely really looks like how the photos look. Yeah. How do you find out where to stay when you travel? Oh, I mean, I get a lot of inspo from other like travel bloggers and things mm -hmm. like that. Like I follow a lot of other people who travel a lot. So sometimes I'll like screenshot somewhere where they're staying and I'm like, oh my gosh, that looks amazing. I want to go there. And when we were starting out, we would like contact you know, resorts and hotels and say, hey, we're content creators, we'd love to come along. You know, would you be interested in working with us? And now that we've been doing it for a couple of years, it's more turned around. So now resorts kind of contact us and say, hey, we'd love to invite you to come along. Uh, you know, would you create a vlog and things like that. So now we pretty much do that for work. Yeah, when we first started doing this, I think there wasn't many people doing travel vlogging. There was a few, but now when we talk to hotel brands, they tell us they often get between 50 and 100 influencers of all sizes, emailing them daily asking, hey, can I come to your hotel in exchange for a post? Um, so we, were, we got in at a good time. I'm not sure if starting travel vlogging now is necessarily as ripe as it could have been a few mm. years ago, mm. um, but it definitely still is a business that's there. But thankfully, because we've got an established audience now and we work with Grazia and we've got the vlog and whatnot, people know what we do, so brands regularly approach us now. So typically we don't, now we don't typically look for places to go to, they come to us. But back in the day, it was very much a case of us just sitting on TripAdvisor or Google, or you know, if you see a blog that says the 10 greatest places to go <laughs> in Italy, we would hit them all up and just you know reach out basically. But if you want some good tips on where to go, have a look through our older vlogs because so many of the resorts that we've been to are just unbelievable. Yeah. So if you want some inspo, check that out. And also if you look at the places that are in um, Asia, they look great, but they're not necessarily that expensive. So definitely worth checking out. This is an interesting one. You probably don't know the answer. <laughs> no, because you've not traveled alone. Oh yeah. This says, if I was to, I think it's a girl. Yeah, it is a girl. If I was to travel on my own, what would be the best options for safety when staying in hostels or hotels? So I have traveled alone a lot. Um, and I think being a guy, it's very different. I didn't have pretty much any troubles at all. However, I did see a lot of girls that did have troubles, especially through Asia. Um, so I would say if you are a girl, try and buddy up with someone. There are websites where you can find travel buddies or even better, if you've got friends who fancy going traveling, go with them. Um, there was one time when um, I kind of had to save a girl who was being harassed and she was traveling alone. This girl came up to me and said, 
would you mind being my boyfriend for five minutes because there's a guy following me and he has been for the last hour. So I think being a guy, it's a bit different, but if you're a girl, definitely try and look for friends that can, can travel with you. It's also more fun if you go with people too. The thing is, I've never traveled alone, but I have a lot of friends who've traveled alone. My sister has like lived overseas mm. by herself for a couple of years and things like that. And I think you can make an effort to meet people, especially when you're traveling. It's really easy to meet other people who are traveling alone. So try to like make little friends along the way so that you have like someone who you've had a little connection with and things like that. And then obviously be really diligent about updating your family and friends on your whereabouts and where you are. So if you're traveling like through Europe or something and you're changing countries, make sure that you're updating your friends or that they have access to your find my phone or something like mm. that so people can track you um, also if you wear an Apple watch if you're ever in any trouble yes. it updates the uh, 911 to the local number so if you press the emergency on your Apple watch it will call the local police for you it also tells everyone in your emergency list that you are in an emergency which is super handy when she was away I think were you in Thailand with your mom yeah. She accidentally pressed the emergency button and like me, her dad, uh, her sister, everyone was getting these emergency <laughs> alerts saying Pia Muhlenbeck is in trouble. So I was it just really drinking does work. at a bar with my mum and sister and my dad calls and he's like, are you okay? What's happening? Like, or you can just post everything on Instagram and then everyone knows where you are. Yeah, at all times. So before we started doing this for work, we were actually traveling pretty much as much as we could anyway in between her uni breaks and whatnot. So we would just get a Greyhound bus and it was super cheap. You can buy like an allocation of kilometers or miles that you can use on the bus. And we just traveled all the way around Australia on a Greyhound and it didn't cost us anything. We stayed in hostels the entire way, just had a backpack each. And that's also a really good way to meet people. And if you do kind of regular routes that everyone else is doing as well, once you get to your first stop and there's the first hostel or the first Greyhound bus, everyone's super friendly. Everyone will come and talk to you and say, hey, where are you going? And if you're going the same route, immediately you've got a load of friends to travel with, which is really, really, I can't emphasize how much it makes the trip way more fun. What do you find is the most cost-effective way of transportation in the places you've visited so far? Um, Tuk-tuk. Yeah, in Asia, it's like tuk-tuks or taxis. They're literally everywhere. So you kind of, you can even barter with them and say, you know, whatever you think is a viable fair. fair yeah amount to go to where you're going um public transport is always really easy so it depends what kind of country you're in i think whereas in europe yeah. you can really get around easy on like underground like trains and things like that europe has really really great what are they called undergrounds yeah like the train system yeah. i think also if you're in the states definitely look at uber x or uber Uber, we, we pretty much use Uber in every country, except in the countries which don't like it. So for example, Bali has a big thing where the locals don't like Uber because it's an international company that's come in and is taking a big chunk of their already small revenue. Um, but just look at what the locals use because that's gonna be the cheapest. And in Australia, buses, super easy to get around. You can get anywhere with a bus. It's not the fastest way to get anywhere, but it's definitely the most cost effective. If you've ever seen Pia on a bus, please send me a photo of that and I'll give you $100,000. <laughs> you just told everyone we used to go on Greyhound buses. I've definitely been on oh, a bus. Oh, I see. Yeah, I thought you meant like just a regular bus that people go on traveling to work. <laughs> just going on a, she doesn't going get on to a meeting on a bus. She gets on like, yeah, coaches. She's talking about coaches, not buses. <laughs> well, this is an interesting one. How are you finding it having no permanent home? <sighs> Okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> this is a little bit of a life update for you guys because we haven't had a chance to record anything or really update you. So you may remember from a vlog a few months ago that we decided to pack up everything we own, put it in storage and live out of a suitcase nomadically permanently. Seem well, at least, at least until the wedding. At least until the wedding, yeah. yeah. Now, it seemed like a really cool idea. <laughs> But honestly, we found it so difficult. We found ourselves constantly having to fly back to Sydney for work. Mm. We were like always, you know, unprepared in terms of like we didn't have our equipment, we didn't have a studio set up. Uh, and we just found it really difficult from a work perspective. I think it's fine to go on like, you know, two week long vacations and things like that. And you can make it work with your travel equipment or your, you know, one suitcase of clothes. But after about two and a half months, you really miss like the routine of getting up and going to the gym and making some food and having your kitchen yeah. and things like that. So we have actually got ourselves a new place. Yeah, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I've been dropping hints everywhere um we'll do a house tour maybe on thursday's vlog yeah i think well we're in it now we'll yeah. show you guys the new place we can't wait to show you we just haven't got a couch we haven't got a couch 
couch because I insisted that we throw out our old couch and now we're like saving for a wedding and so we're like crap we have to spend money on a couch um but yeah we'll try and get it as ready as we can we've been unpacking for the last four days or so and we can't wait to show you guys the new place so definitely doable for a little while but it was just a little bit too much for us even things like samples are being sent to yeah. us and we were like moving around so we didn't have an address that we could give them that mm. we would be certain you know we'd receive the samples and things like ha not having a printer and like just silly little things that you take for granted when you have like a proper setup it's a lot easier when you do have an office and realistically given slinky is you know a retail business it's much better to have like a proper routine and a place to live and yeah. just travel from there but have a base i wouldn't recommend it. anyone that says that you can work remotely and run your business from a laptop in the e-commerce world i would disagree with now what's your advice for best flights to book do you have any tips you use to travel cheaper skyscanner is really good they they kind of scour the web so if you say i want to go from london to italy it will scour all of the airlines and then connect you or show you in a list which is the cheapest one or you can go by which is the quickest or anything like that. It's nice to have that one place that you can go where you can just check every airline and then make your decision based upon there. There's other websites like What If um, and I think lastminute.com, they all use the same engine. Um, but definitely use those aggregators rather than just going straight to an airline and you'll probably save money. Okay, this is a good question. When you're not traveling for work, what's your tips for spending less and seeing more? Uh, try and find the spots that the locals go to. Like, mm. get off the high street, don't just walk around the sort of touristy area, because first of all, like, everything there will be overpriced and mm. will just be kind of touristy and not as nice quality, like, food-wise. Yeah, so if you can kind of get off, like, for instance, in Paris, don't just walk along, like, the Champs-Élysées, you know, walk through the side streets and mm. find the, like, obscure little cafes that you see proper locals at, and that's when you get the real experience rather than, like, the touristy catered experience and oftentimes that's a lot cheaper as well yeah so to kind of get off the beaten track and don't go to all the places that every other tourist says oh yeah you know you need to go to these like exact sightseeing spots go and explore for yourself and just see what you can discover and I think that's a lot more of an adventure and a lot more fun to like you know go out on your own a little bit I think as a general rule if you go to your hotel lobby and you know they always have those like stacks of leaflets showing you all the things you can do in that area don't do any of those yeah. and you'll have a good time because yeah. they're all the same and they're like there's no point going to Thailand and then renting quad bikes like it's cool but you can do that anywhere so try and do the things that are native to that particular country and you'll have a good time this is quite relevant actually do you ever feel pressure to dress a certain way in different countries some places being more conservative than others yeah, most definitely. I think it's really important to take into consideration, uh, you know, the culture of a certain country. Obviously, living in Australia and having kind of a beachy lifestyle, I'm in a bikini a lot, but I always do try to bear in mind what that particular culture is like, especially when visiting like sacred sites or religious sites and things like that. You always need to make sure that you check whether your shoulders can be exposed and, you know, like maybe bring a shawl or bring something that you can cover up with so that you don't feel too exposed in those particular areas. Like in Thailand, when you went to the Big Buddha. Yes. They actually let you, they rent you shawls to wear because women aren't allowed to show their shoulders or their legs above their knees, I think. Both, you have to like fully cover up. Yeah, yeah. If you watch our Thailand vlog, we went to the Big Buddha recently, like Pia had to cover up. Bizarrely enough, that's not the same for men though. Men can wear whatever, so equality. <laughs> Do you use travel credit cards? We don't use travel credit cards, do we? No. I use my phone everywhere. Yeah, we're we're a bit silly like that though. We have we, we don't really research it. I think so. Our credit cards just work everywhere, so we just use them. Yeah, I don't think the cost is is much more expensive. Although we don't have credit cards, we have Visa debit cards. So we're not actually ever using credit. We've got money in the bank, so we're we're just like direct debiting. Yeah. If that makes sense. Or we then, just use an ATM. Yeah, and then we just use cash. So no, we don't really have any tips on travel credit cards. I actually don't know if that's good advice, so don't listen to that. Maybe there is something that you should use, but I don't know, we don't. Pia, your carry-on essentials, what are they? Ah, okay. Oh, let me think about this. Mine's big. I'm going to go get mine real quick. Okay, so the things that I have in my hand luggage. I never like to bring my makeup. I put that in my big uh, check-in luggage because I can't be bothered with those little clear sandwich bags. Some countries make you, you know, put all your liquids in sandwich bags. <laughs> so I pretty much bring the tiniest amount of makeup, like a little powder, a mascara, uh, a little hairbrush, and a lip gloss, and that's pretty much it. 
I love to bring the uh, face halo face wipes or some sort of face wipe so that when I can get on the plane I clear my face so that my skin can breathe a little bit and then because it's always cold on the plane I pretty much just pack a jumper and some socks and I like to pack a change of top so that when I arrive you know I haven't got a crinkly top on that I've been hanging out in for 10 hours but I can actually change and feel fresh and ready to go. Pia's list of things she brings on is so much more impractical than mine. Mine is like <laughs> functional use so I have a plug adapter which will work when any country I think this, this is kind of like every plug socket in the world and you can plug it into whatnot that's super handy um, and then this plugs into a four-way adapter that I travel with so everything we have can charge from one of these rather than having to fork out for loads of those uh, always take a pen with me because when you fill out your immigration form it's very difficult to fill that out if you haven't got a pen and on the plane <laughs> I hate asking the person next to me for a pen it's just embarrassing um, always have USBs because now most airlines have um, USB sockets so you can charge your watch and your phone if they don't have a USB or a plug socket, I have this big battery, which is powerful enough to charge both my laptop and my watch and my phone, which is super cool, because if I'm editing, the battery dies real quick. Asthma inhaler, always handy. I always carry a shaving kit and a toothbrush, because after 18 hours of flying, everyone stinks. So when we're flying long haul, we always try and combat jet lag by working out what time we land and deciding is that daytime or nighttime. And if it's daytime or morning or whatever, we then count back seven or eight hours and that's the time on the flight that we should be forcing ourselves to go to sleep so that when we wake up, we should hopefully not have jet lag. Um, and these things are called Dozile. They're like a herbal <laughs> sleeping thing. They're not like Xanax or anything. They're super weak, but they do put me to sleep. So that's super handy too. What are your top five travel hacks? Whenever you're planning on going to a country, it's always good to learn a couple of key phrases yes. in the native language. You can use Google Translate to find out what the phrases are and pretty much learn like, hello, thank you, how are you, where is the toilet, yeah. one coffee please, you know, just the essentials. Also, from a cultural point of view, regardless of what country you're in, if you can say hello, thank you, one beer please, or can I have this and whatnot in the native language, you get so much more respect and people people like that. I wouldn't particularly feel so comfortable if someone walked up to me and just fired Italian at me. I wouldn't. Yeah. I actually wouldn't know how to respond um, because I can't speak Italian. So, but if that Italian person came up to me and I don't care that he's in broken English, said, can I please have a beer? I would kind of immediately understand firstly that they can't speak English, but they are trying. Mm. And so I think the same thing goes both ways, right? So always try to make the effort and realize that you're in their country and you need to be respectful of that. You can't just turn up and go, well, I speak English, so so should you. I think English speaking people can get a bit lazy with this because you can definitely get around speaking English in a lot of countries. Mm. But, you know, putting in that little extra effort with the locals always goes down well. The next hack I have, and this is from personal experience, email yourself a photo <laughs> of your passport and all your important identification documents. Email them to yourself so that you can access them from any computer mm. that, that has access to the cloud, basically. Uh, so that if you happen to lose your entire backpack in a desert at Coachella, <laughs> you can uh, still get identified as you. When we went to Coachella last year and we lost my bag, which had both of our passports, credit cards, ID, driver's license, everything. The only thing we had left was access to our emails. So when we went to the embassy, we were able to log in and show them the, who we were, was who we said we were, and they were able to reproduce the passport for us pretty much instantly. Otherwise, we'd have been stuck in LA for weeks. Next up I have is a packing tip, and I used to always fold my clothes, but now I roll my clothes. Because first of all, it means that they don't get like distinct creases in it, and it actually gives you somehow more space in your suitcase. I roll my clothes and then I put my rolled up t-shirts in my shoes as well. So you get like super efficient use of space. <laughs> but it don't need to be too efficient because obviously the airport are gonna screw you if you go above 25, 23 kilos anyway. And one thing that we should have remembered is the backpack that we lost, we actually had a GPS tracker in it. So that is such a good hack. They're these things, they're called tiles. And we put these pretty much in every single bag that we travel with so that if one of them goes missing, we can track them. And this is the crazy thing about our lost backpack in Palm Springs. We can literally see exactly where it is. Oh, we yeah. just totally forgot that we had the tracker on. I it. still know to this day exactly where my backpack is. In exactly the, the, the GPS coordinates of where the backpack is in the desert. So next time we go to Palm Springs, I'm just gonna go pick it up. Yeah, so tip one, put a GPS tracker in. Tip two, remember you put the GPS tracker in. <laughs> in my backpack, I always have 
an assortment of pictures of me and Pia. Now, the reason for that is if, if you've lost someone, if, if you've lost a travel companion and your phone dies, how are you gonna say to someone, hey, have you seen this person if your phone is dead? So I think it's really important to carry a couple of old school photos in your bag of the person you're traveling with. So if we've got missing in a marketplace or something, I could literally just go, hey, have you seen this girl? And somebody will either say yes or no. It's a, it's a really good backup to have if your phone dies. How the heck do you keep yourself looking so beautiful after traveling for endless hours in jet lag? This one's probably for me. <laughs> This girl wrote a question saying, how do you deal with jet lag? I know we covered this off earlier, but one thing that really does work as well, if you go out into the midday sun and just have lunch outdoors, I don't know why, it resets your, your body clock. My favorite tip of dealing with jet lag is as soon as you arrive and you've checked in to wherever you're going, do some exercise, like go for a run or go to the gym or something like that and just like pump out the like stagnant blood and everything like that. Like get your body moving again so that you're not just like, lazy and swollen stagnant from blood the is plane. a thing we all have. You know what I mean? Like you just get like <laughs> swollen after a plane flight and things like that. So like get moving. Don't drink alcohol on the plane because it, it dehydrates you massively and bloats you massively. Way you more. say this and you know this, but I don't think there has been a single plane ride that you have not had a champagne on. I was talking to the girls that, who want to stay slim. I don't care, obviously. <laughs> I'll drink all the alcohol I want. Drink champagne on planes. <laughs> so the next like five questions that came in were all about how do you stay healthy when you're traveling? Because it's really hard to eat healthy when you're traveling, which I agree with. Yes, okay, I find that really hard as well. And at the end of the day, I think everything has to be a bit of a balance. So if you are on holiday, you know, have a little fun and don't worry about it too much. But I do like to make sure that I maintain my exercise routine when mm. I'm in other countries. So what I bring in my luggage is a skipping rope and resistance bands. I don't have them here with me right now, but we actually sell them on Slinky. So they're like a tiny little pack of resistance bands and you can just do little workouts with them. They're on the website as well. So if the hotel doesn't have a gym or you know you, your exercise equipment is limited, at least you can go skipping, running, and have little resistance bands to do some weights with. Are you guys naturally very compatible or do you have to work at it? Um, I think with all relationships, you've got to work at them, but also it helps that I'm extremely good looking. <laughs> We do obviously have disagreements. Every couple does. It's completely normal, especially if you're a couple where, you know, your boyfriend's taking photos of you and you work together at all times. There's bound to be some arguments here and there, but I don't know. We just get over them really quickly and then move on. I think that's it. You just got to get over it and realize that you're doing something really, really cool for work. And only like one in 10 people actually enjoy their job. So for us to kind of take that for granted and just start bickering would be kind of stupid. Yeah. One thing we try to do all the time, whether we're traveling or not, is switch off at 8 p.m. Literally, we have an alarm on our phones at 8 p.m. that goes off, and we then, at that point, turn our phones onto silent, um, do not disturb, shut our laptops, and actually have boyfriend, girlfriend time. We just watch a movie or chill out or something. We don't discuss work. I see a lot of couples that end up being kind of in this weird business relationship thing, mm. and that crumbles pretty quickly. So it's important to give yourself personal time and realize that whilst you are there working, you've got to allocate time for yourselves as well. For someone coming to Australia for the first time, where would you recommend to go and what would you recommend to do? Ooh, go with Sundays? North. Yeah, everything's up north that looks great. Tropical North Queensland. I think head to Sydney, but honestly, Sydney's like more of a city. So if you want to see Australia um, and more like the beaches and like tropical vibes, you've got to head to like tropical North Queensland or Perth, yeah. which is super beautiful, like the whitest beaches in the world. Um, so head to the Sundays. I would recommend going to Byron Bay. Byron Bay's got a really cool travel vibe. Um, it's very surfy. Very backpackery. You know, you can sit there, drink beer, and someone's going to be playing guitar on the beach and you can just go and join their little circle. Yeah, there's like one in 10 people who's not wearing shoes. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> How many suitcases do you travel with? Well, that depends on the airline. But Pia just fills up all of her suitcases and then fills up mine. I, oh, I pretty much go everywhere with one. One check-in suitcase and one, what do you mean? She doesn't. <laughs> when do I travel with more than one suitcase? Yeah, you've got one suitcase. And, and half of yours. Three quarters okay. of mine, three quarters. <laughs> like, seriously. One and a half. <laughs> <laughs> for me, half for him. How did you get started on your traveling? We were really into traveling long before we did, you know, any Instagramming or YouTube or anything like that. Like when I was a student at uni and Kane was working and supporting me, we didn't have a lot of money, but we would still, you know, spend pretty much every spare penny we had on traveling and exploring. So 
Back then we were doing like backpackers and greyhound buses mm. to get around and what we would do is like stay in these really cheap places but save our pennies for like really nice spots for lunch and stuff like that so that we could have a little bit of like the nice, nice finer things and we travelled on a budget. Yeah, the two most expensive things that you're going to pay for when you're travelling is the travel itself and also the hotels. So if you can reduce the cost of the travel, i.e. by getting buses and then reduce the cost of the hotel by staying in hostels, you're gonna, like we traveled, I think, I did, I did Thailand on bus and hostels for six weeks and it cost me $800. That's crazy. I paid for flights on top of that as well, but the whole six weeks in Thailand and I was eating two meals every day, uh, two meals every meal, because I wanted to try all the food, <laughs> still 800 bucks. <laughs> Food's real cheap there. And like, let's be realistic. When you're traveling, it's not like you hang out in the hotel room. Like you want to get up yeah. and go and explore. So you may as well, you know, stay in a backpackers or a hostel or something like that. And then just get up and go explore for the whole day and just, mm pop your head back on a pillow at night time. And look up the reviews of the hostels so that you um, can guarantee they're not a dodgy one. Because obviously there are some dodgy ones out there where people's bags go missing and stuff gets stolen and whatnot. But I've always just looked up the reviews of the hostel and if it, if it looks pretty good, then I'm good to go. And hostels, honestly, some of them are so much fun. Mm. Like they'll have like a little bit of a, almost like a party every night, like a bonfire with beer or I guess depends where you are. But it's, I find it to be a really easy place to make friends with people because everybody's in the same boat and everybody's traveling and they're all cool people. Yeah. The best times I've had traveling, we've had traveling, mm. are when we had zero money and we just backpacked. And that was still hands down the best experiences I've ever had. And the friends I've made then are still some of my best friends even now. Yeah. Will you be vlogging the wedding? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm vlogging it. Pia doesn't want me holding the camera, but I'm gonna vlog it. Yeah, we're having a very ongoing discussion where I'm insisting that he doesn't have his camera on him like at actual key moments, but gets his friends, like probably Sam, to help him video. But yes, we will definitely be vlogging. Sam Evans helped me with the engagement vlog, which you may have, may not have seen. And he's really keen to help me kind of complete the full circle of this whole <laughs> adventure and film the wedding as well. But I also want him to be there and have fun with me. So I'm kind of not sure how we're going to do it. I think we're all just going to pass the camera around and make a mega vlog at the end of it. It is going to be a mega vlog. Yeah, it's going to be good. And we've also got a big surprise that we've already planned at the end of this wedding video. So make sure you <laughs> so watch ridiculous. it to the end. You've got to watch it to the end. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> I'll probably have Hollywood knocking on my door. <laughs> Just Hollywood. Just ho the whole of Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. What did you look like pre-surgery? I haven't had any surgery. <laughs> I, nothing's changed really. I lost my hair quite young, so other than that, not much. While traveling, what has been your hardest learned life lesson? Ah. I know the answer to this one. Yeah. And again, I blame you. No, uh, yeah, this was my fault as well. <laughs> so normally we have travel insurance and this one particular trip we went on, Kane forgot to renew the travel insurance and I happened to get really, really, really sick to the point where I had to go to the hospital and we ended up having to pay $6,000 in medical bills without any insurance. In my defense, I did think that I had renewed the travel insurance, but I had forgotten to. Yeah. But 6,000 bucks in medical bills was probably my hardest, hardest learned lesson during and traveling. Yeah, the most annoying thing is that in Australia that would have been covered as just a freebie. So that was kind of a, a, a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. That's where we're going to end today's Q&A, guys. Uh, we got a little carried away with this video, so it might turn out to be really, really long. Part one of 15. <laughs> yeah. But we had a lot of fun filming it, so we hope you had a lot of fun watching it. I hope it was useful. Yeah. I think it should be. Yeah. Also, if you leave a comment down below, you automatically go into the running to win a $50 Slinky voucher, the winner of which we will announce in the next video that we upload. Congratulations to this person and this person. You both won the last two giveaways. Make sure you DM Pia to get your code and we'll see you in the next video. Yeah.